So we're in this amazing high-end electric car. Uh, lovely to see you and let's get moving. Outstanding, let's go. Now, you've got a new book out, or it's recently published anyway, um, and it's called Saving Ourselves from Climate Shocks to Climate Action. So what's this book all about, Donna? Well, Saving Ourselves is basically an agglomeration of 25 years of studying climate policy making and climate activism to understand where we are and provide a realistic uh, assessment of where we need to go. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, as, as we know right now and they're discussing right now at the UN General Assembly, we're nowhere near where we need to be right now. We um, continue to have growing concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Uh, Policy making has just not gotten us where we need to be yet. And as a result, we're being hit with more and more climate shocks that come more frequently and with more severity. And so what the book does is it starts at that point, mm -hmm. uh, bringing together a bunch of research that I've done around climate policy making at the international level and within the United States. And then it says, what do we need to do to get to where, we're, where we have to be to address the climate crisis meaningfully? And I say this while we are waiting. Um, Florida is now expected to be hit with a very large hurricane. They're expecting 15 foot swell okay. so that it's basically going to come the the water is going to inundate mm -hmm. much of the state of florida in the next few days so that's a climate shock mm -hmm. um, it's being caused um, by the fact that the gulf of mexico is the warmest it's ever been mm -hmm. and that is you know driven by anthropogenic climate change mm -hmm. so in the book what i talk about is the way that civil society needs to push back against uh, these vested fossil fuel interests that have you know, basically captured policy making in a lot of ways so that even though everybody acknowledges that we need to phase out fossil fuels, they have privileged access to power and resources mm -hmm. and they are, you know, holding on with, you know, for dear life like right now. Like limpets on the seashore. Exactly. Um, exactly. Their own business model, yeah. Exactly. And as a result, yeah. while, you know, everybody's having this conversation about phasing out fossil fuels, the EIA just announced the United States is the number one um, uh, oil exporter, the number one natural gas exporter. Mm -hmm. We're having a veritable uh, fossil fuel boom here mm -hmm. while we mm -hmm. continue to celebrate the Inflation mm -hmm. Reduction Act, which was supposed to transition us to clean energy. Mm -hmm. And while it did expand clean energy in the United States, what it actually did is just increase all energy consumption in the United yeah. States, yeah. which is not going to solve the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. And that's why I wrote the book, because I felt like it was time, you know, I have written a number of academic mm -hmm. books. I served on the IPCC's AR6 and I wrote about climate activism and engagement. Mm -hmm. And I really felt like it was time to talk to the general public about what was needed mm -hmm. and what we all should be doing to save ourselves because when it comes down to it, nobody's coming to save us. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to do it ourselves and there are many things that we as individual citizens and as collectives can do to push for the type of climate action that's needed. So that's quite empowering because I mean, I, I you know, my career was, uh, you know, journalism on the Times newspaper in the 1990s covering the environment. And then I was asked to join the UN Environment Programme in Nairobi as the uh, Director of Communications and then Director of Commons of the UNFCCC. And I, I've gone through waves of saying, if only we mobilize the public, it would, you know, just tip all this thing over. And then moments of deep, like, no, the public you know, how can you, uh, how can they decarbonize the economy? It can only be done by governments and regulation and the private sector. So I go in waves on this feeling. So the idea that you, you feel quite strongly that we, we the people, if you want to put mm -hmm. it that way, yep. uh, could actually 
do it. Um, what gives you the confidence there? What gives you the, I don't like the word hope anymore, but what gives you the confidence this could be a winning ticket if we can just move it forward? Yeah. Well, the way, way I talk about it in the book is I call myself an apocalyptic optimist, mm -hmm. which means that I have a very realistic view of where we are with the climate crisis, mm -hmm. what's coming because of the climate crisis mm -hmm. in the form of these climate shocks, mm -hmm. and the type of social conflict that will be driven by it. Mm -hmm. um, but then I also, having studied, you know, I've studied activism, both climate activism, but, but also more broadly activism, engagement, and protest mm -hmm. for all of my career. Mm -hmm. And I know that, the, that there is a strength in people power. Mm -hmm. And I believe and am confident that as people experience the climate crisis firsthand, mm -hmm. it will really change them. And I actually have documented it by looking at people who have mobilized or, as climate activists in the past, you know, mm -hmm. five years or so. And we see increasingly high proportions of climate activists who have personally experienced the climate crisis in the form of extreme weather, severe flood, drought, extreme heat, or you know, wildfire or smoke from wildfire. Mm -hmm. And it is, you know, it's unfortunate, but also heartening in that, you know, you and I both started out doing climate back when we were talking about trying to, you know, save the polar bears, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the precautionary principle. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't about protecting us in our communities from the extreme weather. But now that's where we are. Mm -hmm. I mean, in fact, that's what they're talking about at the General Assembly this mm -hmm. week, right? Mm -hmm. So in order to do that, we need to recognize that we need people power. Mm -hmm. And I, unfortunately, the big challenge is that it's gonna take people experiencing this to get us where we need to go. Mm -hmm. And that experience is gonna involve human suffering. Mm -hmm. The big question that you know I end with in the book is really, how much human suffering will it take to get us where we need to go? And there are things that we can all do now to prepare. Mm -hmm. And we don't all have to be activists and we do not all have to throw soup. Mm -hmm. Some people may want to throw soup and my research has also found how that is actually a very, you know, that is a productive thing to do. Certainly, that there is, there is uh, never been a higher uh, awareness, I think, worldwide of this, this risk. Mm -hmm. And mobilizing that sense of, of, of risk is, is uh, yeah, it's a crucial question. I mean, just on the activism question, just coming back, I mean, you know, when Extinction Rebellion started off in the UK and then, you know, other campaigners with, with different groups started doing more extreme, you know, blocking of streets and blah, blah, blah. I, I, w I was very sympathetic to that because I thought to myself, you know, absolutely, you need to, make sh you know, shock people. Then there was a kind of reaction of some people saying, I get it, uh, why they're doing this. But now there seems to be a kind of a rejection by a, a large number of people that they, these people are just being selfish and inconven inconveniencing us. Although obviously climate change would be a far bigger inconvenience to everybody mm -hmm, sure. if we allow it to get completely dangerous. Um, do you Do you sense that we need a new narrative on the activism ticket? Well, so a lot of my research, so my research has over the years looked at activism and protests and, you know, how it fits into this broader uh, spectrum of civic engagement and mm -hmm. civic participation. And within it, I have studied over the years what we call the radical flank, mm -hmm. which is the component of a movement that becomes more extreme in their tactics mm -hmm. because they're frustrated with the, the slow progress or the lack of progress for that mm -hmm. matter. And so what I talk about in my book is the way that we see this radical flank that has emerged in the climate movement, which is really very unradical in a lot of ways. I mean, the radical flank during women's, the struggle for women's suffrage was blowing yes. up a building a month during yeah. the height of the movement. That's right. They, or, they shot somebody, I think, as well on a train. I really can't oh. remember, but yeah, the, the yeah, suffrage. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was very serious. I mean, and in, um, in the civil rights movement, there was a lot of, you know, activism, but there was also a lot of repression. And so what I basically talk about in the book is the way that the radical flank is a necessary component of a movement. Mm -hmm. It plays a big role in helping to expand participation mm -hmm. because, well, the radical flank is always unpopular. Mm -hmm. In fact, I show in my book um, tables from the Gallup poll, which basically looks at a public opinion of the civil rights movement during, during the period that they were engaging in nonviolent civil disobedience with mm -hmm. the sit-ins. Mm -hmm. And less than 30% of the American population supported the civil rights movement mm -hmm. at the time. Everybody else found it horribly inconvenient mm -hmm. and were very, very unsupportive of the movement mm -hmm. or of the groups that were doing this kind of activism. However, what research has found time and again and has found it with the current um, climate movement as well mm -hmm. is that when there's a radical flank, 
people get really annoyed with the folks who are engaging in civil disobedience and more radical tactics, and it draws support for moder moderate components of the movement. So it helps to expand the movement okay. in ways that you wouldn't expect. So it moves from the edge more to the center ground. Yeah, yeah. and it mm -hmm. also does tend to bring the tactics more to more aggressive tactics. So tactics that we didn't see as standard five years ago mm -hmm are now really mainstream and you're seeing more and more kind of radical tactics. And it is true that the normal progression does end up getting more and more confrontational and then violence seeps in. Mm -hmm. And what I talk about in my work um, and in my book is that there's no evidence that we're gonna see violence coming from climate activists. I mean, nobody, and I have spent a lot of time with climate activists here in Europe and in Asia some, um, there's nobody who's really talking about blowing up pipelines at this yeah, point. Right. There's just a book mm -hmm. um, with a really nice orange cover. Mm -hmm. But what actually is much more likely is the kind of repression that we are starting to see around the world mm -hmm. against climate activists. Mm -hmm. And that is where we're gonna see the violence. The violence will not come from the activists. It will come from law enforcement and counter protesters who will push back. Mm -hmm. And that's when we see escalation. And that's what happened in previous waves of activism. Yeah. So that's where we need to be keeping our eyes. Tell me about compost. Okay, oh, compost. Well, so I was, I was saying before, so I am actually coming after this uh, the work from saving ourselves, which ends with these three suggestions, what we need to do to save ourselves. One of which is we need to cultivate resilience in our communities. Mm -hmm. I started working with the US government as they expand out and build these um, climate core, right? Okay. So the administration now has the American climate core, but before that the agencies were starting to build these different core mm -hmm. um, in states, you know, all around the country to basically help to address the climate crisis really broadly. And right. so I've been um, working with the different groups that are running these programs to help them to be effective and to look at the people who are serving, the communities in which they're serving and trying to measure the effects. So of what, are, what are the three things then? The three things that people yeah. should all do? Yeah. Okay, so this is from the book. Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing is that the climate movement, so two of them are for the climate movement and one is for everybody. Mm -hmm. The first one is the climate movement needs to cultivate, uh, not cultivate, it needs to create solidarity. Mm -hmm. And that is true solidarity and intersectionality across uh, orientations and identities because the climate movement continues to be extremely privileged, mm -hmm. predominantly white in many parts of the world. And as a result, it is not bringing in frontline communities, mm -hmm. communities of color like it needs to. Um, in addition to that, the climate movement tends not to connect well with labor, mm -hmm. and that has to change. Mm -hmm. um, so that's number one. Number two is that the climate movement needs to capitalize on moral shocks, including violence. Mm -hmm. And that is what we were talking about before, which mm -hmm. is that a lot of times the climate movement, as it becomes more confrontational, is likely to be faced with repression. And when repression comes, it needs to take advantage of those opportunities mm -hmm to expand and get more people who are sympathizers involved in the movement right by mobilizing people to be more involved with these moderate flank you know fractions of the movement yeah. right and then number 3 is we all need to help to cultivate resilience within our communities and that is not just environmental resilience like making sure that houses and communities are capable of withstanding whatever climate shocks are coming mm -hmm. and everybody has a different one depending on where they live but making sure that our communities are capable of supporting one another when the shocks hit. Mm -hmm. And out of that, I started working with the Climate Corps um, to try to understand what they're doing and also, and this is building off of the work I did with the IPCC, trying to measure the effects of it. Because one of the things that we really do a terrible job of in the social sciences is measure the climate effects, the material effects of social work like mm -hmm building community, cultivating resilience, mm -hmm. um, food security. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I'm doing now is working with these different programs to assess the work that they're doing. We've broken down, um, after our first year, broken down climate work. So that's not like thinking about climate, but rather the kinds of work that people are doing around climate into what we call the four R's, which are reduction, that's you know mitigation mm -hmm. basically, mm -hmm. um, resilience, mm -hmm. Uh, response and recovery mm -hmm. and response and recovery are the ones that people don't think about but it is really a lot of the work around climate is about responding to climate mm -hmm. shocks and helping communities rebuild mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I guess my question for you is not gonna be about compost okay instead it's gonna be what do you think is the most common type of climate work that people are doing today at the local level mm, planting trees I think everyone loves planting trees. But I have another, another answer which I think should be a, a, a fifth R. Okay, what do you and think? And that would be repair. Well, what, how do you define repair? Repair 
goods and services repair, uh, well, repair nature, but also repair, repair society where you can take your toaster or your kettle or your mobile phone or anything to places where they repair it and bring it uh, back into productive so use rather than buying a new one. Oh, I like that, but I would call, I would put that in the resilience category. Ah, okay, fine. <laughs> I think resilience is ridiculously large. I mean, resilience includes both education, yeah. it includes developing like civic yeah. networks so yeah. people are capable of calling one another if you know if they need support mm -hmm. or if you know if they know a hurricane's about to hit to try to make sure that the you know elder people yeah. have support etc yeah, yeah. yeah. or just you know helping to bring people out to muck and gut afterwards yeah, yeah. but the, i remember there was a study wasn't it, on some of the communities that were hit by hurricane sandy and they rebuilt their communities and some of those people in the beginning were like aware of climate change and then they kind of consciously rejected the concept of climate change because they didn't want to live with the reality that they could rebuild their community and it could be taken out again very quickly mm -hmm. and i suppose i sometimes worry about particularly the younger generation having like a new normal where it's just normal that it's hot all the time it's normal that there's no winter you know i mean you don't see snow in the north of england anymore I and mean, as a kid growing up there there was loads of snow everywhere so that's the only thing I worry about a little bit, is whether people, in a sense, mentally adapt to a new climate world where it's very hot, there's lots of hurricanes, and that's like the new normal. Do you know what I mean? I, I completely hear what you're saying. I mean, and, and there's going to have to be a process here, right? And what I talk about in my book is the way that society changed quite substantially with the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. Where, you know, it took only a, a, a matter of months mm -hmm where people went from, oh, I hear there's some sort of a disease somewhere, it could be, you know, affecting people in other countries, to I got to get my kids out of school and we have to lock down and not interact with people. Mm -hmm. And everybody completely changed their behaviors during that period of time. Mm -hmm. And it was this experience of personal risk that drove those kinds of decisions. Mm -hmm. And what I argue in my book and then in, in academic papers that I wrote before this is it is that experience of personal risk that drives the kind of social change that we need right now. And so during the period of Hurricane Sandy, there was a window of opportunity that opened after that where people started thinking about the climate crisis and thinking about how it might be affecting them personally. And then that window closed. And the problem is that the research on disaster and the, the research on pandemic for that matter shows that these windows only open you know, for a certain period of time. And the question is, how bad does it have to get before the window opens broadly enough mm -hmm. that there's enough political pressure and political will? Right. And that, I mean, that's something that I have been asked. And, you know, unfortunately, I can't give the answer is not five. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, the answer is we don't actually know that we need to do more research on it. But there's no question that the personal experience of the risk and the experience mm -hmm. of the climate crisis will mobilize people. Mm -hmm. Will it be too late for people on Tuvalu? Perhaps. Mm -hmm. Will it be too late for frontline communities? I certainly hope not, yeah. but I think that that's what we need to be yeah. preparing ourselves for. I can't stay in my outfit, but I'm gonna do if I really want to, but you know, babe.